Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're just waiting for um, delegates to trickle in. Um, so we'll wait a few, few more moments, um, a minute or so, and then we will kick off, but lovely to see you all joining. Fantastic. Um, we will we will kick off. So um, welcome to get again to everybody. Um, please do feel free to um, turn your cameras on um, so that we can uh, have have more of a normal interaction if your Wi-Fi allows. Um, welcome to the first webinar in a three part series celebrating 10 years since the free school first free schools opened. I'm Sophie Harrison Byrne, the new director of the New Schools Network. Um, although I've been at NSN for a number of years, this is a particularly special um, time to be taking up my new post. Um, it's 10 years since the first 24 free schools opened their doors. There are now over 600 open. When the first free schools opened, there were many that were willing to, to predict that they weren't going to work. Um, but 10 years on, we know that they're more likely to be rated outstanding by Ofsted they're the highest performing um, type of school at GCSE and A-level, and they're more um, popular with parents. Um, I have the privilege of being able to meet and speak with free school leaders regularly um, as part of my, my role. And I never fail to be amazed and in awe of the commitment and clarity of vision and dedication that underpins their success. It's um, no mean feat opening um, a new school from scratch um, and it's, it's a pleasure to welcome our six free school leaders who have agreed um, to share their reflections and experiences of their own free school journeys over the last 10 years. Um, I know it's going to be a really interesting session so thank you very much for giving up all of your time so early on um, in the school term where I know um, you know, there's, there's a lot on and getting all of your people settled. Um, so we really, really appreciate it. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the session is being recorded. I think you should have been notified, but just so you're aware. Um, the, if I could ask everyone, and it looks like everybody is, but if, um, if we could all remain on mute when we're not speaking, just to help with sound quality, there will be an opportunity to ask our six panellists questions at the end of the webinar, um, but please do begin to put your questions into the chat function um, as the session goes on, and um, we will try to get to as many of them as we can towards the end of the session. Um, our first speaker, um, will need to duck out um, after her, um, her talk, um, as there's an urgent meeting at school that calls her away. Um, so without further ado, it is a pleasure to introduce um, Catherine Bubble Singh, MBE, MBE, who is the headmistress of Michaela Community School, an outstanding free school in um, Wembley. And Catherine is going to share her reflections with us and time allowing um, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to take one or two questions before she dashes away so if anyone had been hoping to um, put a question to Catherine please do pop that into the chat function um, sooner rather than later. Catherine over to you. Yeah. Thank you for having me and it's lovely to be here because um, well for all of us it's such a it's so close to our hearts this business of uh, being able to just talk about um, setting up our schools and what we did and how hard it was in the day, you know. It, um, I'm so pleased that things have become more normalized because in the day, so for us, I, I suppose we started thinking about it in, um, in 2011, uh, beginning of 2011, and then it took us a long time. We didn't open until September 2014. Um, and that's because in those days, it was really, really hard to uh, get a school off the ground. I mean, sometimes people did it much faster, obviously, 
we had a lot of opposition. And um, so it took a lot of commitment. Um, whenever I meet people wanting to set up a school or trying to, I always say, well, you know, you just hang in there and keep going uh, because, you know, you can get a bit downhearted, I suppose, as you're going along, but we kept going. And um, when the first somebody suggested to me the idea of setting up a school, I thought it was totally ridiculous. I mean, uh, the idea of setting up a school just seemed absurd. You know, obviously I, I was a teacher, I'd worked in schools all my life, but, um, you know, all the kind of red tape around setting up a school. I didn't want that. And I didn't really know anything about it. And where New Schools Network have been incredible, really, is uh, the support that they give you in trying to set up and finding out about it. If it hadn't been for New Schools Network, I don't think I would have done it, really. It was in those first conversations with New Schools Network that I thought, oh, well, maybe this is this is possible. Maybe this is doable. And then, um, and then also just through the process, having them help either with information and knowledge about the whole thing, but also just kind of emotional support, uh, in particular in those days, because we had a lot of detractors, you know, we would um, have parent evenings uh, and people would uh, infiltrate the parents' evenings who hated us and kind of stand amongst the, sit amongst the parents who were there. And then when we would try and talk to the parent group, they would stand up and shout obscenities and things to kind of drown us out so that the parents couldn't hear us. Uh, at one parent event, we had to hire a bouncer because we were so worried about the possible violence that might ensue. So luckily that isn't the case for most preschool groups. And certainly now that sort of thing doesn't really happen. And that's what I mean about it having become normalized and us um, being more in a, well, in a frame of mind where this this is just an, a route to opening up a school and um so i'm really thrilled to have been part of some of those beginnings um and and then yeah it took us three and a half years we moved from from place to place we first wanted to try and open up in lambeth but that didn't work because lambeth didn't really want us and then we went to wandsworth and wandsworth were happy to have us but the building that we wanted fell through and then we eventually ended up in brent um, and we very much, we were a group of teachers uh, in the main, but there were others as well, uh, wanting to make a difference to the kinds of kids that we were all used to teaching, which were uh, disadvantaged in the city children. That was our kind of expertise and what I've always worked with all my life. So that was the idea of having a school that would uh, cater to them. And so we then set up and we got this building which, you know, isn't the best of buildings. There are all sorts of problems with it. We're right next to the trains and there are no fields and the car park is the, the playground for the kids. So there is no car park for the staff, but we have a building and we're very happy inside of it. And we're very grateful to be here. And what the free school movement has allowed us is a, a, a chance to really own our school. You know, I think that's the big thing for me with free schools and what's so brilliant about them is that we it's ours. And, um, you know, there's something about helping to paint the walls and putting the bins out and, and uh, you know, picking up the phone as I used to do, uh, you know, morning, Michaela Community School and, and so on. <laughs> yes, you'd like to speak to the head teacher, I'll just fetch her for you, <laughs> putting the thing down and then coming back. I mean, that's the sort of thing that happens. And it's, it's really kind of lovely. It's the way you imagine like a small business might happen, you know? And so that, um, and that commitment that you have from the staff because they feel that they own it. You know, there's a staff meeting I need to go on to. And I know that my staff are up there and my deputies are there and they're running it. They'll be running it now and they'll be, they, they, they're just, they're in charge. And what is no, what I've noticed uh, happen over the time that we've been here is that it's become a sort of machine in the sense that, you know, I can step away for a little bit and it's fine. And, um, and we're opening up now another school in Stevenage in 2024. It should have been 23, but COVID has delayed us. And, you know, hopefully looking to open up others in, in the future. So uh, it's really exciting. And, you know, principal, de principal designate for the new school, uh, she started here in our first year in 2014 and has then grown with the school and is now going to be the principal over there. So that is really exciting. It's been particularly exciting, not just for the children here, but all the various people who come to visit us. We get over 600 visitors a year coming to see us and they're generally teachers from all over the country and all over the world actually. Um, and they take ideas and they go back to their schools and they 
do things differently in their schools as a result. So it's really exciting not just to have impact on the children in our school, but also on um, children in other schools and, and on staff in, in other places. So, you know, we've been rather relatively contentious and some of the things we say and so on. Uh, and what's so great about the free school movement is that it en encompasses everything. You've got schools that are more contentious like ours. And then there are some schools that aren't particularly contentious at all and are pretty much more normal. And that's great. You know, you've got everything. And um, it, 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 for me, it's the ownership. It's the, it's the sense of ownership and the ability to bring like-minded people together to be able to deliver whatever vision there is for that particular school. Uh, that's the thing that I find really exciting about it. And um, I just find it's a real privilege to be part of all of this uh, and to, you know, and to be able to speak to all of you today because, um, uh, and it's so exciting. I mean, 10 years, where did 10 years go? I don't know, you know, like it's just crazy, but I suppose 10 years have passed <laughs> and, um, and, and lots has been achieved in that time, you know? And when, when I hear 600 schools, I think, wow, it's just amazing when you think about it. It really is amazing that people at the start of this who lots of people poo-pooed the idea and thought, no way. And all of this has happened thanks to people's dedication and hard work and belief and us all doing it together, you know? And I can't stress that enough. The support from New Schools Network and the emotional support uh, empowered us to be able to keep going through difficult times. And now, you know, it's funny when I tell that story and I look back, people think, oh, well, isn't that great? But you know, at the time we didn't know we were gonna open. We didn't know what was gonna happen. And uh, I'm pleased this is the way it turned out. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's kind of all I have to say. Um, it's it, Perhaps there are some questions. I mean, don't worry if there aren't any questions, uh, don't feel pressure, but if there are any, I'm more than happy to answer some. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and thank you for the kind words about um, NSN. Um, there is um, a question. So um, you talked about how difficult it was in the early days. What keeps you going to open more? Um, and what do you think the programme should be like um, in over the next 10 years? Uh, well, it's seeing, being part of this and seeing um, the the. the great stuff that's come out of the free school movement, the impact that's been made, because we mustn't forget, it's not just about each individual school opening. I mean, it is about that. It's also about those kids and so on. But it's also just, I think the free school movement has sparked debate about different ways of teaching, different ways of doing discipline, different ways of running a school and so on. And it's allowed different flowers to bloom and do things in different ways. Uh, there was more of a monolith before. And the free school movement, I think, has broken that up somewhat. And so doing another one, uh, I suppose I'm just really invigorated by the whole idea of a free school, the ownership idea, um, taking some of my staff from here and putting them over there um, and, and being able to serve another community. Uh, that's really exciting. So, yeah, and it'll be a very different community because it won't be the same kind of inner London uh, community that we've got here. So, and in terms of the next 10 years, gosh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I hope very much that free schools go from strength to strength, really. Um, I think, uh, you know, the detractors sort of say, oh, you know, they're not, there's not enough certainty with them. Uh, you're not guaranteed an excellent school. But the thing is, you're never guaranteed an excellent school in any situation. <laughs> and I would argue that the ownership that people feel it over a free school makes it more likely to succeed. Um, and as Sophie was just saying, you know, uh, the, the stats and the data shows that um, they're doing really well. So uh, I just know anecdotally from word of mouth and so on and schools that I see, uh, often free schools you know, whenever I say to somebody, go and see this school, go and see that one that's doing things in this way, and this one's doing things radically different over here, it's always a free school. I mean, it's always a free school that's doing things radically differently in different places. So, and different from us, you know? So I think there's something in the idea that uh, when people are freed up to be able to own an idea and bring like-minded people with them, that, um, they're more likely to deliver something that's different and different in different ways. I don't mean like us. Um, and then that 
as part of the bigger uh, school system makes the entire school system better because it brings in different ideas and keeps everybody asking questions and debating and discussing, which of course is necessary for any uh, you know, organization, for any uh, school system to, to keep on their toes and to get better and better. And I think the free schools, all of the free schools contribute to that, to that kind of intellectual discussion. Thank you, Catherine. And yeah, we look forward to, to you continuing that debate and um, really look forward to the new Michaela opening and um, wish it wish it every success. Um, we will we'll let you um, touch yeah, off to you. Thank you. Sorry, everybody to disappear. Good luck, everyone else there that you're talking. I wish I could hear your talks, but it's being recorded, isn't it? Being recorded, yeah. Okay. So we'll get you the link. Um, okay, fantastic. Thank you then. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Catherine. Um, our next speaker um, is Sir Ian Hall. Sir Ian is the founder of Great Schools Trust, a multi-academy trust consisting of King's Leadership um, Academies, um, and was the CEO of the trust until his retirement at the end of um, last term. He has over 50 years of experience um, in education and um, obviously a wealth of experience around free schools. So, um, Sir Ian. I think you're on mute. I'm sorry I didn't interrupt Kathleen. <laughs> thank you very much and thank you for the kind invitation. I have actually hung up my spurs, but I'm available for bar mitzvahs, christenings, and anything else strange that people want to offer me. Um, I I'd like to start my story way before the free school movement because I think it's quite important. I was ahead for a very long time in the secondary sector and developed a silly reputation for being a bit of a specialist in turning schools around. But no matter how hard the staff worked, and it really is the staff and not the leaders, we could never get a system where every child succeeded in education. We got close, but that magic Thursday in August, which I, that's why I've no hair left anymore, you would sort of stand at the school gate knowing that something like, even in a really good school, 30% of those children were not going to hit national norms. And in the last, last years of my headship, around about 99, 2000, I became very interested in what was going on that those children actually failed. The school I ran in Manchester, school I was lucky enough to lead in Manchester, eventually became Manchester's top performing school, state school. It wasn't Manchester's top performing school. The top performing school was the independent school, Manchester Grammar, and it was selected. But I got to know the head fairly well, and I I went to have a look at it quite a lot. And the teaching quality wasn't any better than in my own school. The children's behavior wasn't any better, but there was something magic in there that those children were actually going further. And one of the sort of things I put uh, my finger on was the fact that a lot of it was to do with parental backing. And in the sort of schools I was working, there weren't the role models for young children to actually succeed. There wasn't the systems, there wasn't the ethos to make them go though. I was lucky enough in 2006 to be able to work with the new school, sorry, not, not new schools network, National Leadership College, and National College of Leadership and SSAT, the Specialist Schools Trust, and started to visit schools, charter schools in the States, where I started to see very different practices. And in my first visit thinking, gosh, these are awful, because they were very traditional. The practice in the classrooms, it was rote learning, and I was thinking, they're miles behind us. But I slowly came to the realisation that were I thought I'd been very progressive, in becoming very progressive, I'd actually thrown a lot of the traditional ideas out of the water, and I'd lost a lot. When the opportunity came up to open a possible free school, and I applied in 2011, um, I wanted to try something different. I wanted to, being a bit of a revolutionary, try a school that developed self-confidence in children much more than the curriculum, that developed character within them, that gave them the resilience and determination to succeed, that would give them the role models. And the thing that for me that was stopping it, and I'm not anti-union by any means, but there were so many restrictive practices in the normal state system. Some of our children needed longer hours to actually succeed, yet we were hidebound by the 1265. 
but we could get round it by having a different type of mechanism, different type of contracts. Some of our children needed a different access to food because a lot of the children in the service of areas I was working in come to school hungry. And we could change the whole system by giving them food and free food at the mid morning and still manage to survive financially. We could start to work actively in the community and help parents become role models for their own children. We could raise aspirations and get them to university. So with that sort of burning ambition, I managed to get around me some incredible people. And we had a very small team to start in a little unknown place called Warrington. And as Kathleen says, it was hard work. It's very hard work in the north of England, especially in those times, because the Labour local politicians were totally against anything that was not local authority controlled. And they fought and fought us to try and stop us getting there. But thanks to the DFE and the New Schools Network, we hung on in and eventually we started in a disused infant school with little infants toilets for a secondary school. And we had to actually change the whole thing. And it was, it was an exciting time. Um, I had a job in it, unpaid to start with, where I was the person who laid the tables for lunch. And I washed the dishes after lunch and collected the plates in. I, I didn't mind because it was exciting. We were teaching public speaking. We were making children, asking children, playing with them to get them to line up and come in in an orderly fashion. And that was taking out all the disturbance when they entered classrooms. And we were able to look at the charter school and the independent school and say, what are they doing? We introduced residential weekends for children who never even seen a cow. And we took them to the Lake District and we gave them different experiences. And that wouldn't have happened without the five or six very dedicated staff who pulled us through the first 12 months. Our first Hofstede inspection was hard because Hofstede didn't understand what we were trying to do. And it was very difficult to explain to the inspector, but we got through it. And eventually we produced a magnificent building with a good educational model and managed to take that educational model. And thanks to the people who are working in the school, I'm very proud that the first head teacher of that school has now taken over my job. And one of the younger members of staff that we employed, she is now the um, acting principal. Um, fingers crossed you'll become the principal one day but you know I'm very proud of that but we've taken the educational model and taken it further and we were asked by the DFE to take on two schools that were scheduled to close and one was actually a free school and applying exactly the same reasoning the residential the ethos the no excuses not rigid discipline but tough love getting them to line up high quality teaching etc We've now got both, both of those schools working well, and we've managed, we've managed, not me anymore. They've managed to expand now to, it'll be seven schools if it comes up. And I hope, with a bit of luck, it'll get even better. What lessons have I learned? You do get the freedom to innovate. And you get the freedom to do things that other schools don't do. And they don't do, not because they're scared of them, but they're still in those sort of, tram lines that says this is the way school works instead of thinking outside and thinking how can you place that school at the heart of its community so the community become very proud of their own school uh, prattle on for a bit i could go on for another hour but i'll stop because people are better than me ready to speak thank you sophie Thank you very much, um, so Ian. Um, no, no prattling at all. That was very, very interesting. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ed Venker, who's the CEO of Reach Foundation and co-founder of the um, Ofsted Outstanding Reach Academy, Feltham. Ed. Thanks, Sophie, and it's a real privilege to follow you, Siri, and you've been a real inspiration and an amazing career that I can only imagine the contribution that you've made. So thank you so much for that, and thank you for all that you've done. And it's a real pleasure to be on the phone with you. Um, I had a couple of slides and I'm, I wanted to just tell you a little bit of the story. And the kind of brief was, you know, what, why did we do it? And, and I think um, for us, it, it kind of builds a lot on what Syrian was saying about, um, about community, about place. Um, and so we, we came together, um, Rebecca, Kramer and I, um, sharing a mutual kind of appreciation for and, 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 and 
I, having been inspired by exactly the schools that Serene was talking about, some of those charter schools in the States before we set up the school I was living in Washington DC and uh, actually was kind of volunteering a day a week in a, in a kit school um, and, and saw the amazing outcomes that they were achieving, as Syrian said, not necessarily with practices that we would consider particularly kind of innovative, but with a real vision and commitment to do something different to what was typical. Um, and, and so we, 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 we put an application and we looked for a community where there was where there was need, a community that had been traditionally underserved, under-resourced, and we found that in Felsham, there was also a shortage of school places there. And, um, and we put an application in. And I think it's interesting to reflect on whether three, five years later, we would have been successful, because I think the policy, perhaps the, the DfE became a little bit more conservative over time, but we were a, a group of teachers who, who, who had a really, I think, strong plan um, our application was about 470 pages. After our year, they reduced it. We had a maximum number of pages that you could do because we put too much paper in, but we had a really clear plan of what we wanted to do. Um, and I guess a couple of things to say about the school. And Sophie said um, kindly that we, we were kind of judged outstanding in 2014. We, we've achieved some really positive outcomes. We wanted to, to open a school that was different um, in a couple of ways. And, and, and at the heart of that was this desire to open an all through school. So starting taking children from four um, from nursery well from four initially, and then when we added our nursery from two, kind of all the way through to eighteen. And there were three particular things that were interesting to us and, and about that opportunity. The first was to be able to create kind of coherence from a kind of curriculum perspective in the journey that children have through school. So to be able to start by asking the question, what do we want to be true for our children at eighteen? Um, and we start from the from the premise that we want all of our children, we assume that all of our children might well want to study any given subject at university um, and, and beyond potentially. And so what does that mean for where we want where we want our students to be in terms of their understanding of history at 18? Um, and then we work back from that. And that led us to really quite a rigorous, uh, um, I think, and sort of um, focused curriculum kind of all the way through the school and, and actually our our, our curriculum in, in primary has been kind of used and we have a subscription model. We have about 160 schools that use, our, use that curriculum now. And I think it started from this, from the perspective of this opportunity to really map that journey all the way through that you have. The second opportunity around being all through was to bring teachers from different phases together to work together and to, and to be able to support each other. And I think you don't, you don't often get um, primary and secondary teachers working side by side, learning from each other collaborating and that's been really powerful and actually you know some of the best I would say direct instruction I was in you know going around school this morning some of the best kind of traditional direct instruction really clear modeling happens in in nursery and in reception and getting our, 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 our teachers of our secondary pupils to come and really study that and engage with that to learn about how teach children learn to read and all of those things there's a real richness that can come from that. And then the third thing is probably the most important, and that's around relationships. Um, as Syrian kind of talked about, at the core, I think, of, of what makes a, a school is the relationships between the, the pupils and the staff and the families. And I think having an all through school gives an opportunity to create and then sustain really rich and deep relationships. And so that, that, that brought us to this. I mean, if you could jump on the, to the next slide, we, we quite quickly um, came to the conclusion, and this is something that we talk about a lot now, that a kind of great, a great school was necessary but not sufficient. So, you know, it, it needed to be a great school, but actually that wasn't automatically going to make sure that every child um, was able to enjoy a life of choice and opportunity. And over the last kind of five years, we've, we've expanded kind of what we do and we've added um, what we call the Reach Children's Hub, which is a kind of cradle to career model. On the slide here it says a kind of integrated pipeline of provision we have a big focus on early years so we've got 180 families at the moment who've been referred to us by midwifery by health visiting and we're offering um antenatal classes and and, and ongoing ongoing support for parents and one-to-one -one supports and groups and speech and language help all designed to make sure that children are able to start school really ready to be successful um, and alongside that across the rest of the hub we have mentoring programs, we support parents into work, we've set up a foundation degree in early years, and we're trying to find ways um, to support our children and their families beyond what is traditionally done by the school for exactly the reason that Sirian spoke about, which is to say that the barriers that children face are real and can stop them flourishing in school. And actually 
I think schools have an amazing opportunity to, as kind of anchor institutions, we're some of the most trusted institutions in our community, we're some of the best resourced institutions, although it doesn't always feel like that in our communities. And so we can play a, a wider role, I think, than is perhaps traditionally done. And that's been something that we, we knew we wanted to do when we started the school and we've, and, we've, and we've been able to kind of start to do, although we know there's a lot of work left. And then to jump onto the last slide, I think one of the things that's, that's come from the, in the next stage is to, as we, we were doing a lot of stuff and we've got very interested in community organizing, we've, we've been part of setting up a community organizing, a Citizens UK network in, in Hounslow in our borough. Um, but uh, through that, I think we've realized that the, the, the kind of the intervention, the activities on their own aren't enough. And we've uh, inspired by a model called Strive in the States. Um, we've set up a Felton Convening Partnership, which is seeking to bring together um, institutions and community members from across um, from across from across Felton. So we've got local the local university, secondary school head teachers, some primary heads, people who run the local who own the local nurseries, and the head of public health commissioning, a faith leader, um, an arts charity, and then some parents, some young people, some other community members coming together to say, what, are, what is our vision for our community and what are the complex problems that we're trying to solve? And we've started, we're a year into a seven year partnership trying to create um, a kind of collective action and a kind of energy around systemic change, which again, we feel like schools are uniquely positioned to play a kind of central role in. Um, thanks so much uh, for, sh for sharing the slides. I think we can stop sharing now. So that just gives a little flavor of the journey that we've been on. Um, and um, yeah, and I'm and, uh, and happy to discuss it more when we get to the Q&A. Thanks so much, Sophie. Thank you, Ed. I think, you know, coming back from maternity leave, I'm as ever struck by there's no resting on, on laurels at um, reach, you know, turn my back for eight short months and, and we've got convening Feltham added to, to all of that fantastic work. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, we're now um, going to hear from Karen Hayes, who's the principal of Derby Pride Academy, an outstanding alternative provision free school um, that has links with um, the charitable arm of um, Derby County Football Club. Um, Karen. Good afternoon. Uh, very much for the invite. It's, it's very much appreciated. Um, just going to give you a little bit of context, really. We're, uh, the school is in Derby City, which is a very small uh, unitar Unitarian local authority. Um, and secondary education in Derby City is made up of 16 mainstream, one pupil referral units and six special schools plus us. Um, what inspired us to, to become involved in the free school programme? Originally, it was because um, the mainstream school that I worked with as a deputy in the pastoral responsibility there, we're looking um, for alternatives for some of the more challenging pupils there. We had an instance where there was a young person that... Um, he brought a weapon into school and it was it was a it, we didn't want to permanently exclude him but we not, knew that he needed an alternative and in the in the city at, at that time there was very little in terms of uh, alternative provision for somebody who was as bright as he was um wanting level two qualifications so we we saw an opportunity to offer the other mainstream schools in the, in the city uh, an alternative to permanent exclusion, but but with a particular focus on providing level two qualifications. Um, we designed a, a curriculum which we could deliver in an alternative setting, but using more humanistic and, and person centred approaches, and we linked up with a number of um, with other colleagues and providers across the city, including the football club, uh, to to try to do that. We started with a temporary building, um, as lots of free schools have, and that was challenging. It was on an industrial estate. It was a very old building, um, waiting for our building to be uh, to be to be made. We started with six pupils. We, we've got a pan of 50, but we started with six. But very quickly after that first half term, when we moved into our um, new building, our intake started to increase, not just from pupils within the local authority, but actually from pupils outside of the local authority, because we're central and there was lots for the counties around us. All the way along, um, 
on average, our outcomes um, as an alternative provider have been consistently outstanding. And, and some of the, some of the you know the, the the most outstanding features of that is that um, eighty nine percent of our pupils, on average, leave with at least five GCSEs. Whereas if you look at the national average for our context of schools, it's twelve point three. So we're looking at you know, six, seven times the national average. Our attendance is on average 15% higher. Um, and a majority, 95% of our pupils move on to positive destinations. From my experience, in the beginning, in the early days, we were really viewed with suspicion, uh, particularly by the, the local authority. And in particular, the local authority maintained pupil referral unit that was in the city, the other alternative provider. Um, we felt at the time, because we were one of the first AP free schools, it was five of us, and I can see Marie's on the call, and she was one of the, the first five as well. Uh, and we thought we felt that the, the policy for our existence was de being developed and evolved as we went along. Um, and we were actually probably setting some of the policy there around that, and the New Schools Network were really helpful at that time in trying to help us and uh, get those networks together so that we could speak together as uh, AP providers. One of the main things that happened after the first two years and two terms, when it was communicated that our base funding for alternative provision would be deducted from the local authority um, from their high needs block, actually the relationship deteriorated further to, to the point where we were described as a half a million pound problem. Um, I'm really, really thankful that that's completely in the distant past and, and that's not where we are now. Um, we're fully integrated into the city's educational landscape, landscape, including representation on all of the panels in the FR access, secondary placement, head teachers. Um, we, we're centre to the secondary behaviour strategy and I lead and chair that strategy for the whole of the city secondary schools. And also I lead the peer challenge uh, for use of alternative provision across the city as well. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more detail and, and I'm really proud of the fact that as an alternative provision free school coming from 2012 from where we were as that problem we we're now at the center of the city's behavior strategy um, in 2019 permanent exclusions so last year were, were and fixed term exclusions were at the highest level since they've been recorded in the city of particular concern was the increase in permanent exclusion for persistent disruptive behaviour, which in 2012 was, was not, not there at all, it was 0%. In 2018 19, 54% were, were being permanently excluded for persistent disruptive behaviour. Our local PRU was oversubscribed and overwhelmed, and we were asked um, if we would step in to support the local authority uh, to take some of those PX pupils. Uh, is at that point that the realisation that something had to give, that there needed to be more preventative intervention for these pupils at risk of exclusion. Um, and, and that's where we realised the system was failing and the local authority asked us as the AP provider to, to help to formulate a process that would mean that more preventative work was being done um, before it got to the point where we've got exclusion. I think what I'm trying to say that is, is that as a free school, you know, we've become a central part of, of what, it, you know, of the educational landscape. And we've, we've worked collaboratively with the inclusion lead, um, with all of the heads in the city. We've managed to get them all to sign up to a mission statement. And that's no mean feat when you consider that lots of our secondary schools have got big multi-academy trusts sat behind them. And you've also got a CEO sat behind them that's looking at, at the bottom line as well as everything else that's going on. And you've got to try and get past all of that. As, a, as a, an AP free school that takes students from all over the city, we've got a really um, insightful view of, of what each secondary school is doing in terms of their um, inclusion agenda. And we can sit there as a, as a neutral and, and supportive body that people can contact to say, well, what can we do with this child? What would you do in our situation? Um, we, we moved then through this uh, working and steering group um, to a, a situation where instead of having permanently ex permanent exclusion places for each of the school, which, which is where it, it ended up, we had 40 places that were allocated by the local authority for schools to use. Invariably, they all filled up to a collegiate model where we are just actually looking at the needs of the children uh, holistically, regardless of what school they come from. 
Um, we've grown ourselves Derby Pride an intervention catalogue that looked at pre-early help and, and intervention and we've shared that across the city and that's now been picked up by the Department for Education's Opportunity Areas Board and it's been enhanced um, so that it's used not just for secondary now but it's moving into the primary sector. Um, we negotiated with the local authority as a group of, of, of people um, to, uh, to look at the costs that were associated with permanent exclusion and negotiated some, um, some funding to support us to move to that collegiate model. So, so what, what's been the outcome? What's been the, the outcome of that? Well, it, in 2018-19, there were 63 exclusions, uh, permanent exclusions in the city and were small. Last year, there was four. So we know that the work that we're doing to try and reduce permanent exclusion and to use Derby Pride and the, the local proof for preventative work it is really working. Um, we want to avoid that permanent exclusion. We're going to need to look this, the COVID will have had an impact on permanent exclusion reduction. So we're going to use this year to see a, a better indication of success. Uh, and, and that's what we'll do. You, you may ask, what are the benefits for Derby Pride as a free school, um, you know, moving into that area of becoming something that is working collegiately across the whole city? Well, we, we've, we've built really strong beneficial links with our mainstream colleagues and this has helped because we invite them into Quality Assure our, um, our uh, subjects. So we have schools in the city who have got a particular expertise around languages, they've got a particular expertise around uh, history. We want a broad curriculum as APRI providers. So um, they come in and they will quality assure. And in some cases, particularly around the subjects that we can't offer because we don't have specialisms, they will help us with teaching staff to come in and deliver some of that for us or to quality assure it. It's also increased the confidence in our offer and has led to an excellent um, level of place commissioning, ensuring our financial stability. The AP sector has gone through an absolute nightmare during COVID in terms of um, referrals and therefore the financial turbulence that goes along with that if you've not got a, a really good commissioning um, program and that's really helped us. It's also allowed us to move back to preventative AP and that where we started in the first place the free school moving children back into mainstream after a period of uh, turnaround. I think the biggest advantage of all is um, we've benefited the whole system um, and the knowledge of inclusion that we have across the city has provided a means for a positive change, um, a, a positive system change across the whole city. I think to close, I, I, I'm, I think what I'm saying is that it's my firm belief that an opportunity afforded to us in 2012 to open a free school in Derby um, has had a huge positive impact on the pupils we serve, but not just that, um, the whole school system here in Derby, and, and I'm sure that some of the leaders within Derby who we're working with would, would you know, would agree with me in that in that case. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And yeah, I mean the the wider impact of free schools, I think, is one of the you know one of the many many successes of the program. And I think is something that all of the speakers have touched on to date, and is definitely something that resonates with me. The the wider impact that free schools have had um, beyond their immediate communities um, and on the you know the whole sector. Um, and equally um, internationally as well. Um, so, so thank you. Um, our final, final speaker um, is Tristan Williams. He's the principal of Venturers Academy, which is a free school um, in Bristol that was rated outstanding. Um, sorry, a special free school in Bristol that was rated outstanding for um, people's personal development, behaviour and welfare. Tristan. Hi, good evening. Um, Karen, thank you for that, and you know, love the connotation of the continuum um, of provision. You know, Ed, great to see concepts of the of the all through um, system. You know, I I believe in a continuum of the provision from year um, early years right the way through to key stage five, and also the continuum of provision between mainstream and and special. You know, and I suppose if we look back at the days where I thought that multidisciplinary teams were working together under the Every Child Matters agenda, that actually social services, health and education were actually combining forces. I think it's down to us now as educationists to lead, to lead those key areas. And I think, Karen, the work that you've done, the work that you've articulated has been wonderful. So hopefully I can touch on some of the multidisciplinary work that we've also um, embedded in, in, our, in our city. 
And to be honest with you, um, I feel a little bit intimidated um, talking after such fantastic people as well. But um, thank you for, for the welcome here today. So basically, five years ago, we were aware that there was an increasing number of children in the city of Bristol with, with education, health care plans or statements as they were then, but with a primary diagnosis of autism whose, whose, whose needs were clearly not being met, that there was no specialist provision for um, these young people within the secondary phase at all. So a group of parents decided, using their voice, hearing about the free school movement, that they approached the Society of Merchant Venturers and the University of Bristol, who were sponsoring schools in the city and said, I think you can help us develop a specialist all through school for children with, with autism. The um, school named Ventures Academy did then become the first school within Bristol as an all through school for children with a primary a diagnosis of autism. And this is where my real passion sits, where multidisciplinary practice was central to the mission of the school. You know, I am aware that with modern medicine now making a significant um, progress that more and more children are surviving prematurity. You know, some recent research by um, Epicure shows that 90% of premature babies now survive, with 63% of them having a disability, 60% of them having ADHD, 10% of those children um, having autism. And we're aware now that because modern medicine has moved on so significantly, the education system, which is probably 10 to 15 years behind, is catching up. And we're also aware that because of this statistic that premature children are one of the main reasons why we're now rewriting our send registers um, nationally. We're also aware through this research that there's currently 80,000 premature children in our um, primary schools in England and Wales, that's on average four in every 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 class primary but only six percent of teachers have been taught how to meet their needs so one key area that ventures academy does um, does produce at the moment is a truly inclusive multidisciplinary approach that doesn't just happen within the special school but also happens across all our mainstream um, um, partners within our multi-academy trust but also very similar to my colleague in Derby leading on the education side around um, supporting colleagues across the city. So we work very hard with our community looking actually what our moral purpose, what is our mission? And we came up that our true mission as a school was to enable young people from very vulnerable backgrounds to overcome barriers to social, emotional, mental health and academic development by delivering the truly outstanding, inclusive, highly personalised curriculum but developing that through a multi-disciplinary approach. And we came up with two um, hashtags which have developed that we use for our Twitter feeds and everything of that nature. And the first one is to work hard and to be kind. And the second hashtag is where everything is possible. And why did we come up with, with, with these two mottos? Well, we felt that as a school community, by working hard, that we give our best every day that we never give up and we need to keep on improving. Well, why be kind? Well, by being kind, we speak with care. We listen to understand and we do helpful things. And what we felt initially, and this has proven to be one of our, our, our core ingredients is that this in turn doesn't just build cohesive and respectful teams within our school, but also we're developing and building cohesive and respectful communities right across the city. And that is underpinned then by our other motto, where everything is possible. Therefore, all children within the special school do have an education healthcare plan, do have a primary diagnosis of autism, with all the students having speech, language and all communication needs. The school has rapidly grown since opening in 2016 with 28 um, children in a dilapidated 1955 prefab uh, building. But I'm proud to say that as of this September, there are just over 220 students and the age range has grown down to early years to key stage five across um, three sites in the city. Brand new buildings, which has cost over 20 million. We're incredibly proud of that. With our multidisciplinary teams now working cohesively across nine mainstream settings, also leading on parenting groups within our mainstream settings. We've also got a research centre 
with one-way mirrors where we have parents attending, looking how we as professionals work with um, children and young people. And again, part of our research centre is that we can lead on excellent inclusive practices across our trust with 4,000 children. And our budgets have grown from 1 million in the first year to over 6.5 million now, with staff numbers growing from 14 up to 165 within a multidisciplinary setting. So we keep on checking what our moral purpose is, and we've actually rewritten some of those, some of those key values, and I'd just like to share those um, with you. And, you know, student voice to me is, is crucial, and every step of the way we take our young people with us, um, you know, taking their voices, listening to their interests, and we came up with these words, so I'd, I'd like to share them with them. Um, so our purpose is to connect learners as local citizens of today with the ideas, knowledge and skills they will need as global citizens they must become. Our students engage with the familiar and be engaged with the unusual, be immersed in language and communicate in multiple languages, know how to practice, be resilient and be challenged, be proud of their local environment and think on a global scale, to win fairly, lose gracefully, accept help, give willingly and embrace a selflessness. Love difference, be different, and stand up for the rights of others because it is the right thing to do. We want our students to be relentlessly creative, curious, and to live ambitiously. And when our vision is achieved, we want our students to leave as, as successful learners with inspiring qualifications who are motivated to enhance their knowledge and skills and achieving beyond what they ever thought was possible. We want them to leave as a self-confident individual who can make informed decisions and communicate them based on their values and their beliefs. To leave us as responsible citizens who respect others and take part responsibly in political, economic, social and cultural life. And to be effective at contributors with a positive attitude who can lead or work in a team meeting the challenges of the 21st century. And if we get those things right, some of society's most vulnerable children may well become the politicians of the future, may well become the leaders of this country. And actually seeing the transformation of some of those children who started in that school in 2015, 2016 now, who have moved on to mainstream education, who are participating in um, doing their A-levels beyond the special school, there can't be anything more satisfying than transforming lives of society's most vulnerable. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Tristan. Um, yeah, what a what a lovely um, mission and value statement. Thank you for sharing it with us. Um, thank you so much to all of the speakers. Um, whilst our delegates um, gather their thoughts together with any questions, I'll just um, highlight the things that have really jumped out at me um, listening to all of you. I think there's something around the importance of being able to own um, these schools and your vision. Um, that percolates through everything you know the clarity of your vision you know really really the hard work and the dedication um, and bringing that coherence to everything that you do um just listening to you speak um you know exactly what what, what you're trying to achieve and how you're going to get there and all of you share the um drive to be constantly improving um you know there's no mean feat to set up these schools but you know as i said to ed there's, there's no resting on laurels you're always forward facing and forward looking and thinking what can we be doing for our children to make this even better and not just the the children that are lucky enough to attend your fantastic schools you all are making a huge contribution um to the wider system and when i think that there are you know only 600 free schools um the the amount that um, you're all adding to your local communities and the national debate about best practice in schools it's it's truly inspirational and um you know imagine if there were more um the wider impact that that we would have um and the final thing is is you know the extent to which you all work to integrate yourselves fully and meaningfully in your communities um particularly um often in situations where you weren't a welcome um, school to begin with and you know listening to the stories of how you've worked tirelessly to to um, endear yourself to your local communities but you know again really improve the local offer um, whether in mainstream AP or special so thank you very much and um, that's a really 
really nice way for me to um come back come back to work and be inspired again so thank you so much it's a real privilege um we have a few questions so i will um dish them out as they, they come please keep them coming um so we have a question um for tristan how is how important is being in all three school to the mission and values um of Buntress academy um and well, i think we'll just take that uh, take that one and then there's one for um all of our speakers to um consider whilst tristan's answering that one which is um what are your hopes for the free school program over the next decade tristan i think ed, um, i think ed articulated perfectly some of those um key areas around um the 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 all through um you know we've got all through special and and mainstream um with it within within our trust and my my expertise was predominantly within within secondary but having the all through um elements there are certain um strategies and skills that our primary colleagues have actually improved practice um you know within within our secondary element the subject specialism that we found within secondary has also become very very important in aspects of professional development for some of our our primary partners and um you know, within the primary curriculum, um, there's 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 one kid who we've developed um, this concept of a curiosity curriculum, and we've we've had very interesting debates actually through some between our primary colleagues and some of our secondary colleagues that primary staff members some in our in our setting thought that teachers within, within secondary were very formulaic in the way that they taught, and actually by observing them they said oh. Secondary education is much more creative than I thought. It was much better than, than when I was in school. But I think the co-construction of a curriculum that leads from early years right the way up to key stage five, you know, we all get challenged on sequencing, on progression. And because that is co-constructed um, right the way through through our, 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 our key stages, then I, I've, I've, I've got true confidence that every step that the child needs to follow is 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 created in the, in a particular way, but also because of the aspect of the special school, if a child doesn't quite get to a particular stage um, by a particular age, then within that all school or through element, it seems to be um, less complicated to revisit certain key areas, especially within within some you know the you know some of those subject areas. So. Um, what, was I a huge advocate of an all through school before I opened one? No, I wasn't. Have I convinced that, that have I been convinced that it works? Yes, I do. Yes, I am. And um, would I advocate for it into the future? Yes, I absolutely would. Thank you. So, so just for the audience benefit, so did you, you join the project when that was a decision that had already been made? Yeah, I was actually chief executive of the chief executive of a trust working in, in Surrey. And I thought, oh, this is a fascinating project. I live much closer to Bristol. And uh, yes, I, I came back and um, the project was about six or seven months away from opening. So um, um, I did quickly rewrite some of the uh, paperwork to make it um, slightly more um, in line with some of the values that you've heard uh, today. So um, yeah, I wasn't there from the first the first day of um, when it actually came to um, to fruition. But most certainly, with the sponsors, with the local community, loved the pre-opening part, the seven months leading leading up. Learned so much um, and revisited quite a few areas of the curriculum that probably I hadn't visited um, for a while. And it was so satisfying to open on that first day. It was almost as if there was a royal visit, but it wasn't a royal visit. We were actually bringing in children into a free school, and that was, a, you know, a magnificent feeling and something that I'll hold close to my heart um, until I finish within the education profession. Thank you. So, is the the shorter commute that um, drew you in, and that all through that will keep you there? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the question for all the panel, which perhaps I'll. Um, put to Karen first. Um, what are your hopes for the, the free school programme over the next decade? We um, obviously know that the approval of more free schools has slowed and um, there have only been two in recent years. So it would be really interested to hear your thoughts, Karen. 
So I can speak to you from an alternative provision point of view because inclusion and, and alternative provision is, is, is the passion that I have. It, it became really, really difficult to open an alternative provision free school towards, towards the, the end. Um, when we did it, um, it was it was it was simpler in terms of the financial model. But now, different to a special school free school, alternative provision um, has to has to go out and make sure that there's got enough commission in. And, and, I, and I understand the reasons behind that, but it's very different to a special school. And what it does is it prohibits um, innovative alternative provision that is regulated, opening in areas where it's needed. Um, and sometimes leaving unregulated alternative provision that is not responding really well to the needs of, of pupils in place. So I would like to see the model, the financial model for alternative provision to, to be match to match the, the special school alternative, uh, the special school financial model. So it makes it easier um, to open an alternative provision free school. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Ian, anything from the mainstream point of view? You know, when, I first be, when I first became involved with the New Schools Network, Michael Gove was the uh, Minister St Secretary of State for Education. And irrespective of anybody's politics, the guy's got a heck of a brain. And unfortunately, he identified the resistors and called them the blob. And over the years, this blob has started to look, for me, at free schools and think, some of those innovative practices are quite good. And the nice thing is I'm beginning now to see state schools checking on the practices that I see in schools like Ed's and other free schools where they're starting to emulate us. And there, there can be nothing better than that because that way we know we're actually changing the system. For me, free schools have always been the icebreaker of the educational movement in the sense that we're out there trying to be innovative, trying new practices, very quietly to start with, so you know, we had to get away with an awful lot of murder to start with and get it done. But we're in the next 10 years. I think eventually local authorities will suddenly realise that they haven't got the capacity to improve schools anymore, nor the funding. And it will come down to very innovative um, academy trusts that start to encompass schools like Carolyn's, sorry, Karen's and Tristan's into one unit. You know, we've now moved that we have our own um, APU within the trust, so we don't permanently exclude people. I'm seeing other people doing it. And I hope that within the next 10 years, the free school movement will not become extinct, but will become the model for innovative educational practice. I think, I think um, what, what I would add to that, I, I, I agree with all of that. I think it's, it's interesting that um, if you look at the charter schools in the States, um, if, you, if you take all of the charter schools that have opened since 2003, half of those schools have since closed down. And I think there is, a mu there is much more dynamism in, 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 that kind of, in that kind of system. And obviously the most effective schools have, have flourished and been really successful. But because there are lower kind of capital costs around um, setting up schools and they're often in the buildings of, the, of other schools and so on, and there is less worry about the kind of the physical infrastructure, I wonder whether there is an opportunity to look differently at um, the kind of turnaround model and, and look at particularly some of the communities where the improvements that we've seen in some parts of the country and in some schools haven't been have, where that hasn't happened in, in places and look at innovative ways you know I don't think we're going to have hundreds and hundreds of brand new schools at a time when money is incredibly tight post post pandemic and um, our, our birth rates are falling uh, people are leaving the country because of because of Brexit etc so I think the next 10 years potentially is going to be different ways that we can enable people with ideas and energy to make a contribution that is different from, um, you know, doing that in, in the kind of, in the, in the existing sector and in the existing school system. Absolutely. And I think um, ensuring within that, that, as you say, the innovation and benefits are reaching the parts of the country where we all know um, there is a there is a need and um, I think also I was struck again by um, I think it was Catherine who 
or perhaps was it you had saying that um you know were you applying now with your um once innovative but now kind of lauded and, and uh, emulated models whether um you would have been approved had you applied um later down the line so yeah um nurturing that space for innovation and, and targeting it effectively um I'll just uh, pause to see if there are any other questions coming in um, to my chat. Um, but uh, whilst um, whilst I do, um, just a, a quick question for um, each of you. I think Catherine um, touched on it in her talk in terms of um, her advice for people wanting to do the same. But what would your what would each of your advice be to um, someone right at the beginning of the process? What would, what do you wish you had known or done? Shall I go first on that? Grit your teeth. Okay. It's going to be a hard journey, but it'll be a journey you'll remember for the rest of your life. But it starts by having a very strong vision of what you want to achieve and being able to sell that vision and get people to align with it. I firmly believe that what's needed in the country is, is what we produced in many of our preschools now where they are mission driven and values led. And that's a part of the education system that disappeared, but it's strong in the independent sector where they're getting obviously most of the top jobs in the country and crowding out Oxford and, Oxford and Cambridge. We can emulate that, but we need the young icebreakers behind us now to come up and take over the next 10 years. I like that. I like that metaphor. I'm not sure your dog liked it so much. He's um. Oh, he's left. He's, he's skulked off. Um, <laughs> um, Tristan, what would your advice be? Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure if I can actually top that because you know, you know, gritting your teeth, believing in your mission, being values led, and you know, there's 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 one thing that I've recently learned is keep on revisiting what those core values are because as a, as a school leader. Unless you keep on revisiting those values yourself, sometimes your staff members, especially new staff members coming in and the growth and expansion that, that, that we've gone through, actually don't, I'm saying they don't buy into, um, into the culture or, or, or the values, but I think one thing that I've learned is that setting up is really exciting, but revisiting those areas, revisiting those values involving your community, I think is crucial because the free school feels strongly attuned and aligned with what the community is trying to do and with what the families really, really need. And yeah, and you know, the next generation, the next 10 years, I think, I think is exciting. I've probably got 10 years left in me. I'll probably be burnt out somewhere along, somewhere along the way. But you know, there is incredibly creative um, leaders out there. And you know, I'm a big believer that special schools, alternative provision, mainstream schools, the way forward is more cohesive practice. Economies of scale, I think, is important. I fully agree with what Ed and Ian have also said, that local authorities don't have economies of scale, possibly expertise these days to lead on transforming um, um, outcomes in, in, in schools. And I think if we're going to really, really have multi-academy trusts moving up to that next level, you know, special schools, APs and mainstream have to work, um, you know, cohesively. And, you know, I'm a big believer that every multi-academy trust should have an alternative provision, special school and mainstream provision in it, because that is one of the best ways of, of sharing good practice, but also embedding multidisciplinary teams and actually having ownership um, over that process, I also think is important. So yeah, that's, that's the vision that I'd like to have that within, within 10 years time, um, multi-academy trusts, you know, right across the country, have got a combination of AP special and, um, and, and the, you know, mainstream with a clear, clear focus on, um, on, on you know getting over the barriers of disadvantage you know that's 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 one of my my key areas for for the next decade thank you yeah and another area where free schools are leading the way in absolutely piloting the model um yeah definitely and um not a question but just a, 
a comment from um, the floor that um, an amazing, it's been an amazing 10 years and the greatest joy, um, sadly the person's not um, given their name, has, but has um, been seeing the standard of AP rise from unregulated poor quality pr provision to good um, and outstanding AP schools that transform the most disadvantaged young people, um, a shining light for, for those people. So um, a, a testament to, to, to all. Um, Karen, any um, thoughts from you? trying to get myself off mute that that seems to be a bit difficult to do <laughs> um, I, I think what I probably would have done differently in the very beginning it, it was quite isolating in the very beginning quite a difficult uh, journey we, we did we did have uh, obviously the, the help from the new schools network and then we got our help with the with the group of uh, AP schools that we worked alongside I think um, building more co-productive relationships throughout the um, the authority and earlier than we did would have probably been more helpful for us um, in the early days. And I think that that's something that I would probably do again, it, you know, if I had the opportunity to go forward again, I think making sure that we've got um, co-productive relationships. I, I'd listened to Tristan talking about AP and mainstream. I absolutely agree with you on that. The difficulty that we have in our authority as a small authority is we've got 14 secondary schools. I think there's about four or five mats over the top of that. And what we didn't want to end up as was um, a, a sort of AP for that one particular mainstream school. I was really keen that we would serve the pupils for the whole of Derby City and not become uh, an AP for one particular multi-academy trust in that way but I can see the benefits having gone through this 10 years um, in quite a lonely position as a as a principal with, with without that support above be, being something that I think would be a good thing to do if I ever if I was to ever think about doing it again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Karen. Hopefully we'll be able to tempt you um, in the future if there's the opportunity. <laughs> Um, Ed, any um, final thoughts for you? Yeah, I think my advice would be that it's all about the people you have around you. You know, it's a team, it's a team game and having people who um, are fun to work with, have that sort of shared values, have that shared commitment. And I think as much as possible when you've got that group, going together to see schools and, and being able to see it firsthand and agree what it is about those schools that you like, that you want to emulate, that you don't like and that you don't want to emulate and trying to build that kind of shared vision. But at the heart of it is, is creating that kind of, that group of people, whether that's your governing body, whether that's your founding group of teachers. And, and, and I think spending a huge proportion of the time that you're, that you're thinking about this kind of networking and building that team is, is probably my main advice. Definitely, yeah. And I, I think another commonality from all of you is, you know, having that shared vision and, and sharing it with your communities and your staff and your teams. Um, I don't think we've had any further questions. Um, and I know our panellists have had um, busy days in school and um, probably have many other things to, to go on to. Um, so I think I will uh, wrap up there and just end by saying thank you so, so much to all of you. Um, as I said at the beginning, it's always um, inspirational and energizing to, to hear the stories um, and your reflections and your experiences. Um, and you know, thank you very much for your time. Um, it was really interesting and um, yeah. And thank you to our delegates for coming. Um, I don't think I've, I've um, missed any housekeeping but if I if my if our fantastic events manager Graham um needs to needs to tell me anything please do um but yes um the only the only other thing is just to um remind you all that this is as I said the first in a three-part webinar um so if you've enjoyed today and um, we have two others upcoming um the first is next Wednesday on the 29th of September again from four to five and it's um going to be a kind of slightly a uh, broader conversation about reflections on reform with Sam Friedman and Rachel Wolf. And the final um, webinar is the, again the Wednesday after on the 6th of October, um, and that's focusing on where next. I know I've posed the question to our panel, but um, that third and final one will be really focusing on the future, and that is with um, Dame Rachel D'Souza, um, Sahami Patel and Martin Oliver. Um, I'm uh, very excited about, about those sessions. I hope to see lots of you there if you're able.